So we're in the midst of an incredible transformation where computer science, including the work here, is, is sitting in a central role. And if you think about, well, what's biology about? Well, a lot of it's about analyzing DNA and protein expression and finding patterns that only a rich software approach uh, will make possible. Now, uh, when we think about learning, uh, computer science is at the center of that. When we think about modeling new materials, uh, when we think about you know, making new vaccines, all of those things, uh, software element uh, is, is stronger than before. You know, eventually, with this genomic data, we will be able to solve uh, very tough medical problems. Uh, one of the diseases I uh, spend a lot of time uh, learning about and hoping that we can make progress on is malaria. Uh, today, over a million people a year die of malaria. Uh, that's mostly children in Africa. Malaria at one time was spread uh, almost over almost the entire globe. In fact, even in uh, northern United States, there was malaria, and there was a lot of malaria down in the south. Well, in fact, fortunately, uh, it didn't have a strong hold uh, as you got that far north, and so the invention of DDT as an insecticide and the application of that actually eliminated it and we only think about malaria today when we travel into those regions. Unfortunately, what that's meant is that the focus of uh, investing on that particular disease is, has been very low. Uh, but there's reasons to be optimistic uh, that advances in modeling drugs, modeling vaccines uh, will, will help us get there. Also, we're modeling the disease itself, uh, techniques that come out of physics of uh, modeling uh, actually let us look at various factors like the types of vector and the weather and understand what new tools we'll need, uh, bed nets, medicines, uh, indoor spraying, that will let us reduce the ma malaria map uh, very dramatically. And so you wouldn't normally make a, a connection between malaria and those million lives a year and the need for advances in software. But in fact, that connection uh, is very strong uh, and you can expect to see uh, great progress because of the kind of technology uh, that's worked on here. Also, when we look at a, a tough problem like energy, and you know, I spent yesterday in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Department of Energy, uh, you know, trying to understand the sort of complex politics of various things like a cap and trade bill. But in fact, if you zoom out and think, you know, how can we have it all? How can we have uh, developing nations uh, experience the kind of lifestyles that we're used to, uh, have our lifestyles advanced. The fact is it's innovation, innovation in material science uh, for solar thermal, for solar, solar photovoltaic, modeling approaches for new nuclear designs that would be radically different and avoid some of those problems. And again, we come back to computer science and some of the very advanced work going on. It is very possible, and I'm optimistic to say it's likely that over the next two decades, we'll get energy approaches that not just meet an environmental constraint of not uh, putting out uh, greenhouse gases, but also that meets the constraint of being less expensive. Because the only way to help the poorest is to bring the cost of energy down from what it is today. Uh, that's transport, that's fertilizer, that's clean water. It's the empowerment uh, for them to live the lifestyles that we uh, take for granted. And so they're uh, the central role of software is uh, uh, providing something that's important. So we're going to see some great things in the, uh, the years ahead. Uh, some of these advances are being developed here at Carnegie Mellon right now. Uh, others uh, will come along as we get new generations of students here in this facility taking advantage of, uh, of what we're uh, dedicating today. So I'm always inspired when I come here. I'm inspired by the great minds that are here and the ones that will be coming here. And I'm inspired by the opportunities to do work that's both fun and interesting, but also makes a big difference, not just in the United States, uh, but to the world as, whole, as a whole. Uh, so I'll be following your work, and I can't uh, wait to see uh, these great advances uh, that are delivered and the, the progress that will enable. Thank you. So uh, 
I'm pleased that Bill Gates is able to answer some questions. I ask that people who want to ask questions, and I encourage you to do so, to come up and use these two microphones, and we'll have a, a session here. Right here. Hi. Uh, my name is Leanne Sudall, and I'm a PhD student studying computer science education and how people learn about computers. With the amount of great work that your foundation does in terms of bringing education to uh, urban schools and the less privileged children, how do you see computing literacy for our next generation as they try and reach towards Carnegie Mellon? Well, certainly in rich countries like the United States, the opportunity to use computers and be familiar and comfortable with them and to actually have them be a key part of the educational process has really become like reading literacy itself. It's something that we've got to make sure uh, is available to everyone. Our best ally in doing that is that the price of computers continue to come down and the price of connectivity continues to come down. If you buy you know, say a netbook type computer for a couple hundred dollars, if you're lucky enough to be in a place with Wi-Fi access, uh, you know, use that computer over a number of years. Uh, particularly if it can avoid your having to buy textbooks, you're already at the point where it's a net savings for the students, where those four or five textbooks, you know, we've got to do a little more work to get that done, uh, but you're net ahead. One of my favorite projects that the foundation did uh, was working with the over 50,000 libraries in the United States and helping to provide computer hardware, but not just the hardware, the right software and the training. And when we embarked on that, uh, we did a pilot project down in Alabama, we wondered if the librarians would embrace it. You know, this is a strange machine, and you know, is it just kids coming in to do something weird? Uh, and you know, how do you deal with the thing it breaks and people stand in line? But in fact, by really learning and working with them, uh, we were able to uh, get an incredible reception. In fact, it's really revitalized the libraries in rural areas even more so than in urban areas, but in, in both, I'd say. And so that's, that's been very successful, and it's been maintained over time. So if a kid doesn't have his own machine, you know, it's community centers, libraries, schools, there ought to be ways that you can get access. And that's an important threshold, because it's only when we make that assumption that these interactive learning tools, like the uh, Carnegie Mellon Online uh, Initiative, it's only then that you can require those and actually you know, maybe even reduce the time in class and have, have the interactive learning be part of that. So getting pervasive access uh, is, is an enabling factor. 